Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest from UCFB's Insight Series. I'm Mark Clement. This is the series where I'm fortunate enough to sit down with leading lights from the worlds of football and sport and ask them how they got to where they are now. It's the sort of job I absolutely love. I've done it for many years on BBC radio and television and indeed as an event host, including working with UCFB on their Future Leaders Graduates Conference and also launching their global summits, as I did in Melbourne in early 2020. And our guest today, and I go way back, as we welcome sports broadcasting royalty, Sky Sports' Hayley McQueen. So, Hayley McQueen, I'm going to explain stories like how we got a six and a half foot lion to the top of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona and all sorts of tales like this. But you've got to go back to work next week at Sky Sports. Mm -hmm. I haven't had your maternity leaves. So first thing I've got to ask you is, honestly, how are you feeling? What, what sort of emotions are swirling around you having just had your maternity leave? It's weird because... It's very mixed. I want to spend more time with my little one because we've been in lockdown. It's been uh, definitely a different experience than I'd imagine my, my maternity being. But I do think I need to get back out. I need my brain to work in a different way. I need to speak to other adults. But I had hoped that when I was stepping back into an office, I'd be surrounded by lots of people, have my wonderful co-presenter to get me through everything. Um, and it's just going to be a bit odd because I'm going to be entering a half empty office I won't be able to see my lovely colleagues who will be working away in the gallery in a completely different room. I don't know, it's not quite the return to work that I'd hoped it was going to be, but I'm going to ease myself in gently. Um, and at least when I head back, we'll have football starting as well, just a, a few days after that. So I've got all of that to build up to and lots of live games to report on and, and stuff, which will be at least give me something to do when I'm at work. Mm, but but sort of emotionally, yeah. I mean, have you been able to totally relax and enjoy this amazingly precious, important time, your firstborn, or the other sort of work things that swirl around you as well with this very unique mm -hmm. situation that women have, which is you have to step out to do the bit mm -hmm. that the man can't and, you know, you you feel that emotional bond. So is, is the bits of... FOMO in there is the is the kind of bits of anxiety about work moving on and stuff has that been yeah. with you as well yeah I definitely I think a lot of women in my industry as well particularly as you get a little bit older I think if I'd had kids in my 20s you can kind of pause your career and pick back up and know you've got another decade or a little bit longer to keep going because I've done a lot of um I've done a lot with Sky already. I've hosted a lot of programs it's like well where do I go next and it's that kind of stepping away from work to try and completely cut off whilst you see your colleagues taking on new challenges and fitting into new roles and you think, oh, I would have liked to have done that or I'd like to have covered that or I'd have liked to have been there. But then for the last five, six years, I'd see mums with prams and parents thinking, I want to be that person, I want to do that. So it's always very much the grass is always greener. You kind of always, always want what you don't have and then you get it and you sometimes don't quite manage to appreciate it. I think the lockdown situation has definitely made me cherish the moments with Ayla a little bit more because I wouldn't have had a bond as close as this, I don't think, because I'd have been probably splitting my time between socialising, seeing friends, seeing family, spending most of my time with her, but stepping away from the family home and still trying to you know, do little bits of freelance work. I'd been working with the LMA and working up at St George's Park, hosting a few events. I was set to do a few uh, women's football features as well before venturing back to Sky. And I was quite looking forward to just dipping my toes into that and stepping out of kind of mum mode for a while. So I, yeah, I'm, I've missed out on a lot of that, which is a bit of a shame. And you, I do see colleagues kind of moving and being given opportunities that I have been given myself and I'm sure other people during my time have looked at me and thought, oh, she's been given this and she's been given that and I've got to wait for my turn. So, yeah, it's been a little bit, it's been a little bit odd. But, but this is not to say that you are in any way, not every bit as passionate towards the role that you've got and things. But do you think with maturity, with lots and lots of hours on the clock, mm you become you have a slightly different perspective on work and you you kind of see it in a bit more context and 
Mm. And, and actually that subjectivity benefits work as well in, in, in the reverse of this. Does that, yeah. does that kind of fix? Yeah. Been doing I think, this a long time now. Yeah, and I think a lot of a lot of my life has been work, 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 stepping away from work and still working, having work on the mind, watching football, watching cricket, watching golf, watching rugby, whatever it may be, athletic sport, and watching it and almost critiquing it instead of just enjoying it. So I think now's the time where when I'm away from work, I think I've got to make sure that the, the time that I spend to really relax my brain, relax my mind, I'm, I've got to cut off from work mode. I think obviously having a baby is the best distraction because she's not interested in Man United playing on telly or the England cricket team. She's got absolutely no clue what's going on. She's like the moving figures and stuff on the screen and that's great. And one day she'll be able to sit with me and, and watch some football. But yeah, I think there comes a point in life where you do need to have a bit of a better balance. I think for so many years, especially as a female, you kind of battle and battle. And I try to make sure that I'm on top of everything. So if I'm off work for a couple of days and there's been a, a big a big match or there's been a sporting event that I feel like I should be on top of, but I wouldn't necessarily be watching because I'd want to go out with my friends or something. I feel that I make sure that I watch it and that I'm on my phone a lot. I'm not I'm not very present when I'm out amongst friends and, and family because I'm, I'm looking at updates. I'm looking for the scores coming in. If I'm not at work on Saturday, it's like being at work because I'm having to look at everything. I enjoy that side of things, but it's trying to kind of remember key things that have happened because I might be going to work the next day and all of that, of course, suddenly becomes very important. So I think when you're working in sport, broadcasting, you'll be the same. It is quite hard to cut off. There's one element of you loving the sport that you watch away from work, and there's another part of you that's trying to take as much in as possible so that you don't feel like you're missing out. Even on holiday, there's no such thing as taking a holiday. You go and you have a week off. If it's out of season, it's quite easy. But then there might be, you know, a women's cricket tournament happening in the summer. And I want to make sure I'm on top of that. So you're always very present in the mind. But well, then, then when, when something that's been a, a passion and a, a hobby becomes kind of part of your life as well. I find that, say, Tuesday night tends to be the end of my week. I've worked the weekend. Mm. Some people go to me, oh, do you want to come to a match? And I'm, I'm almost footballed out and I need, yeah. I need a couple of yeah. days at home. Does that, is that the same for you? Do, can you almost, can, I won't say I don't, no, I don't not love football, but, but do you know what I mean? There just comes a point at which you need a sort of cut off from it just for half a day, just to clear your head before you go again. Yeah, no, no, exactly. And I think now being a mum will definitely make me do that a little bit more because there are other priorities and there are other things that are more important than just following sport and making sure I'm on top of all the stories and scrolling through social media and Twitter and seeing what's trending. I'll be more keen to make sure that the time I spend away from work is spent a little bit more wisely. Yeah, I will, of course, still watch live sport, in particular football, but I think I'll be a bit more um, clever about when I pick and choose to watch things and I'll just have to forego. I mean, I'm quite lucky because my other half is not into football at all whatsoever. So it's not like I'm trying to get away from work and he's dragging me back in as we've got to watch this. And there's the Monday night football, there's a Friday night game, there's Saturday night football, all oh, there's back to back games on a Sunday, all oh, there's midweek stuff going on. He doesn't care. So actually having a relationship where my other half isn't part of my industry, that sort of helps as well. And it means that he'll bring me back He'll bring, right, you're a mom, let's do this, let's do that. We need family time, we need a family day. And I think for me, I was quite keen. I mean, God, years ago, I think I thought the dream would be to hook up with a footballer and live a very extravagant, rich life where I didn't have to pay for anything myself. Then realized, actually, why can't I just do that myself? I can earn my own money, buy my own house, buy my own cars. It doesn't have to be by being with somebody else. And then I got to my 30s and actually thought, I need to meet someone who isn't in my industry so I can step away. Having a father who's involved in football, having a granddad who played football, all my family are so engrossed in sport, I needed to make sure that if I did end up finding somebody, which I have, and I'm really lucky, it was a little bit later in life, um, that he doesn't either work in media or in sport, and he doesn't. And it's nice to just step away from all of that sometimes. Wow. wow. So it's so unreal. unreal. Yeah. If, if somebody from football had tried to pop off with you at some point, you, you had a sort of uh, a wall that came up and, and you're uber sensitive to sort of repel them. They'd have to have been top notch 
to get through the door yeah especially in my 30s because also you don't want to just be seen I mean I think wag is a derogatory term and I think it's a bit unfair there are lots of wives and girlfriends who have their own careers their own mind their own thing going on um but I wouldn't have wanted to be that person that is I want to be Hayley McQueen broadcaster not wife of partner of fiance of girlfriend of do you know what I mean Mm. Um, and I wanted to make sure if I had a career that people respected me for that and not just the, oh, well, she's she's hooked up with some sports person now. She's not got any interest in what she's doing or he's a multimillionaire, so she doesn't need to earn this or she doesn't need to do that. I don't know. I don't know if that really makes sense. But, yeah, I definitely wouldn't have gone out with anybody in sport. Well, I didn't in my 30s, that's for sure. Amazing. Right. Listen, mm -hmm. um, we met at Borough TV, mm. Middlesbrough's in-house TV, and they kind of did that as pioneers quite early in the kind of movement of in-house we TV. So first, I want to take you first back. Club channel, first club world. channel ever. Sorry? It was the first ever club oh, channel. Right. Mm -hmm. Even before MUTV. Yeah, yeah. But before that, obviously, you were immersed in this football household. So can you remember what kind of age you were when you became aware of the fact that you you know your old man was playing for scotland in world cups and play had played for leeds and man united and all the rest of it and and how it affected you and and the direction you wanted your life to take yeah i think it wasn't until i was a teenager when i was young i don't think i really knew what my dad did i knew he went to training we i never saw him play we were never taking really? football no nope. my mum had me and then less than two years later my sister came and then my brother arrived a year after that so she had her hands full um i don't remember recalling watching my dad ever play football even on the television we were kept away from it very much i know we were taken to the players lounge sometimes at manchester united when we were small but i was i was too young to remember that I mean, my mum had me when she was 30 so she was a little bit older my dad was nearing 30 um my dad's career when i was born was coming almost to an end it was the end of his time at manchester united i was born in just the well almost 1980 but yeah it was 79 so i'm okay. ancient um he left in 85 just before sir alex ferguson came in so i was five when we left manchester and we moved to hong kong which is where i was um, grew up for well a couple of years we lived in hong kong and my dad was a player coach but again it was it was exciting we were in a different country i was at a different school it was sunny every day we got to go swimming outside after school most days we had a brilliant time in hong kong um and i had no idea why we were there my mum kept us very much away from that and it was probably only when we returned to scotland when my dad got a job working on scott sport with Jim White, funnily enough. Wow. Um, believe it or not, Kirsty Young was also working on the program. I think she was a, a researcher or an assistant and a floor manager and a producer. She had lots of jobs before she herself went into broadcasting. So dad was working for STV um, and I would see him on television and then kind of realize, ah, okay, that's what my dad does. So I have known my dad more as somebody to feature in the media or a broadcaster than I kind of, knew him as a as a footballer i mean he's always just my dad and it's it's it takes other people and their stories to kind of remind myself that that's what he does and that's what he did it's weird i don't know an awful lot about my dad's playing career but when i worked for manchester united television so many ex-players and fans would come up to me and tell me stories and i had no idea i was a bit uneducated about it all so that inspired you to get into the media seeing you your dad involved did you go and do a bit of work experience in and around what he was doing yeah. or you... so i obviously did my i started off doing standard grades in scotland then moved to england to teesside when brian robson took over at middlesbrough football club and dad and brian had made a pact that when one of them got a job at a club they would take the other whether it be as a manager or a coach coach whatever so my dad obviously went with viv anderson and brian robson and moved down to teesside which is where my family still live it's where i call home now um because again that's a difficult one where are you from where did you grow up i'm like i don't know but teesside is is to me home it's where we've lived the longest um and where i feel that when i drive up north i'm, I'm like relaxed and i'm there so we got very lucky that my dad took the job 
at Middlesbrough Football Club. And I think it was him there, me doing my GCSEs, going off to do A-levels and kind of realising I know a lot about football. I've I've always watched it on telly. It's just always been there. I've always been around it. I mean, my sister works in 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 fashion and advertising. My brother's in the kind of music industry, but I was the eldest. I was the one that took more interest hmm. in all of that. And as I got a little bit older, I was the one that got to go to the games whilst my mum was at home with my younger sister and brother. So I remember going to Ayrson Park um, quite a bit. And it was, yeah, Borough against Oxford United, my first ever game. And then, of course, the Riverside. And going there most weekends and finding that quite exciting. I got to travel away to some away games. And I was very lucky because obviously dad working at the football club meant it was quite easy to get hold of, of tickets and things, which I know some kids, um, it's like gold dust trying to get your parents to you know take all three kids to a football match and the cost um, of going to away games and the travel and the food and everything that, you know, the, the accommodation even. So I was very lucky. I was in a privileged position that not only did I get to go to football and watch it, I got to hear the football conversations. I got to have an understanding of what it was like to have a dad who worked as a coach, a scout, a manager. Um, he'd managed in Scotland as well, but I don't really remember much of his time up there at, at Ayr and at St Mirren. Again, we were, we were kept away from that. We were all busy at school and my mum had her hands full and my mum worked full time as well. She ran her own business in Scotland. So it was only really when we moved to Teesside that I started to really love it. And it was at a time you remember when we had all these really exciting players playing um, for a club, like seeing Janino up close for the first time with what he did with his feet. I'd never seen that before, apart from, you know, maybe the Brazilians in the World Cup on, on a television. So yeah. that was quite rare and having kind of Ramon, Ravinelli and Emerson and, and eventually having your Paul Morrison's and your Paul Gascoigne, some of real great big characters and following the stories. And I think then I knew I wanted to work in, in sport and in football, but took myself off to study. Um, it was PR, marketing and journalism and then specialising in one of them. I could have gone on to do media studies or sports journalism, but there weren't that many females doing it at that point. There's a really good college in Darlington, which I ended up going to and, and doing a few classes there when I took a year out to study art because I wasn't allowed to go traveling. My parents said they wouldn't pay for me to go to Thailand. So I studied art instead, but that wasn't going to be a choice for a degree. It was always going to be something that I could apply afterwards. You study art, what, what, what do you do? You become a great artist or wasn't that great or you become an art teacher. And I didn't really fancy that either. So yeah, I ended up specializing in the journalism side of things, moved down to Epsom, which is where the college was, um, just south of London and yeah, absolutely loved it. And it was there I did my first big um, work experience job, which kind of made me realize I wanted to work in television, which was um, basically making tea uh, for this morning. So it was when Richard and Judy were presenting it back in the day. Oh, and come on, gossip, gossip, gossip. Yeah. Now you know, but obviously, uh, a lot of the UCFB students tuning in now will be around the 20 mark, late teens, mm -hmm. 20s. So, Richard and Judy were like icons of television oh, yeah. back in the day, weren't they? Were they, were they okay to work with? You can tell we us. Weren't, we, we weren't allowed to speak to them or communicate with them. We no. But I was working in Hatfields in the kind of office, opening the fan mail and deciding which ones were important enough to pass across making sure that if there were any if there was anything a little bit too dangerous that was that was sent to <laughs> a person that dealt with um you know security um i would make tea for just everybody in the office and i eventually got the chance to work um within the fashion department so i would head out um with models um and clothes and a stylist and a photographer and i just basically be an assistant with 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 them with the models when they'd be on location and then we'd head back to the studio the the piece would be edited and put together. I would ask to sit in the edit. It was the first time I took a real interest in how things were put together, having been on a shoot, how they were cut, the music, all of that. Um, and thought, well, maybe I would quite like to get into producing or assistant producing. And that's kind of when I thought, yeah, TV is for me. I've worked at TFM as well, but just again, as a promotions girl and on reception and just as a bit of a skivvy in and around the office. But Radio was great fun, but TV was kind of where I saw myself working. And I, I definitely didn't think I wanted to be a presenter. Um, it was a couple of years after that, I thought I would be quite comfortable and I'd be okay doing that. But I, I didn't set out to be a presenter. I wanted to work producing little programs. I even still, when I worked for this morning, I think I, I fancied still working within the fashion industry, but then realized the competition, especially as a female, was fierce. 
but there were hardly any women working in sport and football. And whenever there'd be a guest coming into this morning who would be a sporting guest or whatever, I would always find myself a little bit more drawn, drawn to them. I do remember one time, so Richard and Judy, I'd never had any communication with them. They didn't need to be talking to me. Um, and one time Rod Stewart had come in to be a guest to do an interview, yeah. And I'd said to the head of fashion at the time, a woman called Sarah Van Heerden, I just said, oh, I'd love to just go and speak to Rod Stewart. And she was like, well, like, don't be ridiculous. She went, don't you think everybody wants to meet Rod Stewart? I said, no. I said, actually, I said, um, my dad knows him. She was like, oh, and I said, my, my dad played football. It's the first time I'd ever even mentioned anything about my dad. I'd worked there on and off Christmas holidays, Easter, summer holidays. I said, my dad actually played football. I said, and um, Rod Stewart loved my dad. Um, he might be a Celtic fan, and I think my dad was sort of more towards the Rangers side of things. He never played for a Scottish, a Scottish club apart from St Mirren. I said, but he played for Scotland. And I said, I know I used to hang out with Rod back in the day and 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 go out and have parties with him and stuff. I said, so I'd love to just say hi and and ask if he remembers my dad. And um, I don't think they were all that happy about it. She said, oh, well, if the, if the opportunity comes and he's in and we think that's okay, we'll maybe ask his his PA or his assistant or whoever he was with. So I'd made sure I got in super early that day because um, I was doing that but this morning. I was getting there for six o'clock in the morning, doing all the, the pre-programming stuff, staying whilst we were on air. And then at lunchtime, midday, I was then going to uni for the afternoon. Um, and it was quite a trek. I was in East London, heading to central London, then wow. down to Epsom and back. I don't know how I did it. I don't know how yeah. I managed to do it um fizzy drinks and pick and mix I think got me through my uni days and yeah Rod Stewart came in and he was with uh, um might have been his agent and his partner as well and I just said to him, I said oh I said I think Rod might know my dad I said I'd love to just say hello and um Rod was kind of lingering I said oh you might not know who I am I said I feel really silly doing this I said I've never introduced myself to a guest before and he just looked at me I said oh my name's Hayley McQueen he went Gordon McQueen I went yes and he gave me a big hug and made me feel really special. And your dad, and it was the first time I ever just felt like, oh, this is, yeah, I felt like I felt quite special. So I'd just been this meager assistant for ages. And it was the first time I'd used my dad to kind of get me something um, to meet Rod Stewart. I never asked for a photo with him or anything. I don't even think camera phones were invented back then, Clem, but um, I think I had a pager or something. And we, we chatted for ages. And it was at that point, quite a few of the other staff who obviously had never really bothered with me before started to be nice to me and wow I, I, just in that moment you'd, be, you'd have been tempted just to sit back on that sofa chatting away to rod flicking the v's at everybody else and stuff no, like I, that wouldn't you? No. But, I, I do remember that and it's really silly because it shouldn't have taken a celebrity to give me time of day for other people to have given me a bit of time yeah. of day you know what i mean no, but you, you've painted a picture, and this is a recurring theme we've had throughout this series of everybody telling us, because I'll finish off by asking you for three tips you want to pass on, but a lot of people say whatever role you find yourself in, mm. be passionate about it. Apply yourself to the maximum. Do it to the mm. best of your ability. And that's the picture that you've painted. There's been long, long weeks months years of of working to get yeah. that on that first rung of the ladder and you mentioned fashion that's my first memory of you actually because <laughs> no, you this. came back to teesside because i'm a borough fan as well yeah. and wasn't I, the, it, wasn't, I, it wasn't some kind of weird sale out the back of gilly's car or something was it no no it was no i know what you mean gary giller used to sell yeah. clothes but it mm -hmm. i'll tell you what it was you ended up producing a program that I was presenting called the Rory Roadshow. Oh, this yeah, is Middlesbrough's it. mascot, six mm -hmm. and a half foot lion. And we were going off to Barcelona mm -hmm. to take some kids over there because Middlesbrough were about to go into Europe for, I think, their second consecutive season. And so to make sure all the crew stuck together, we had these T-shirts printed with something like Rory Roadshow on tour or something. And they turned up and you were such a girl about it. That's a man's T-shirt. There's no way I'm wearing that. And you stopped getting ready to, to go and fly out to Barcelona the next day. And you spent the next hour cutting it the, the sleeves round i think i don't know what you did you reshaped it you did that you <laughs> sewed it and you made it to be a sort of skinny fit and things so that it looked better on it i mean i don't blame you but it's my <laughs> I, I, remember that. 
that is a weird memory but yeah I probably did I probably did I wouldn't care now but yeah back then all it was all about the image Clem <laughs> yeah of course it was and then we had this we, we so we take these kids over to Barcelona to make this this program I think it was two or three one hour uh, strands uh, and I remember they did it in conjunction with EasyJet because we nicked the EasyJet plane yeah. to put in the edit at some stage and things but I just have this overriding memory of of the man playing the mascot wanted to stick to the protocol of never taking the head off didn't he and he did and and he went to the top of the Sacrada Familia in Barcelona, which is so darn high, it's unbelievable, with these size 15 shoes up these tiny little medieval steps. I mean, he must have lost about four stone that single day alone. Mm -hmm. That suit must have been dripping with water mm -hmm. in the bottom. It was, yeah, and he did. I remember going to a fast food restaurant with the kids and he sat there with his with his full thing he didn't want to take it off because there were other children in there he didn't want to scare them and he sat and i remember we were all eating our it was mcdonald's wasn't it we were eating our mcdonald's and he just sat there and wouldn't even he wouldn't touch it we were like well you can just go and go somewhere else and eat it take it off but he would not be seen in public and he obviously wasn't going to sit in a public loo and eat his mcdonald's was he no do you know what i've just remembered i went to the manager of that mcdonald's and said could we borrow a staff uniform so he could get changed somewhere eat his food then go and get changed back and he refused to do it he didn't want to spoil the magic for the kids and i'm going in his ear come on they know you're a human being you're not a real lion but he still wouldn't do it well there you are who'd have thought that 20 years later would he used five minutes of a key podcast for ucfb to <laughs> reminisce in this way so when when did you make the switch from producing where you won an RTS award or all television? Well, the Society? program did, didn't it? But yes, I'm very, I've still got that, you know. I, I don't see it on the wall behind you, but I shan't take umbrage. It's when alongside my dad's trophies in his trophy cabinet. It's pride and place in my dad's trophy cabinet. Mm -hmm. Love it. Uh, you just, you've just made my day. You then went from there to Sky. How did you make that bridge? And when did you do the flip from producing to presenting? Because that's yeah, the thing that so, a lot of people. So the producing was just kind of playing around and learning on the job. You remember at Borough TV, it was just us lot, a lot of youngsters, lots of kids fresh out of uni, just experimenting. I learned how to um, edit a little bit on Final Cut Pro. We had Media 100 as well. So I was kind of trying to learn little bits, but there were far better editors than us working there. But I wanted to at least have a bit of understanding of how television is put together. I'd worked in the gallery doing all the counting down for the, for the other presenters. And I think, I mean, God, I think we worked there. I worked there for three, four years, maybe. It was quite a long time before we were all made redundant. Um, and of course did the auto cue as well. And it was only in that last year I stepped in front of the camera to start presenting a few of the little bulletins because Claire Wilson at the time had gone off to have a baby. So they needed somebody to help with maternity cover. We had um, we had a guy who, who'd come in obviously to help cover but couldn't be there all the time. So Adam Nolan, the head of the channel at the time and the late great Alistair Brownlee who I sat next to for many years enjoying his um, great love of Jaffa cakes um, had said look and commentaries and commentaries just everything he was brilliant and just the per he was just the most optimistic happy person in the world he was like well what's going to happen nothing's going to happen he said just go stand there put an outfit on look nice just read it out what you know what can happen because I was absolutely petrified of standing in front of the camera and making a fool of myself and of course I had even now I've got a little bit of a mixed accent. People think I'm Irish because there's the Celtic of the Scottish there and there's the tea side. And obviously I had a couple of years in Hong Kong when I was younger and it had a little like a, an, of an Amer American twang. Um, and obviously being down south now, I have to, you know, get my P's and Q's in order and pronounce everything properly. Um, and I do have a little bit more of a TV voice. I wouldn't say I put on an accent, but I definitely try to pronounce everything a little more proper. Um, so I was very aware of, of image, just everything. And I think I was a little bit nervous and had maybe half a season of presenting the news bulletins. Dad at the time was working down on Sky as a panelist with Charlie Nicholas, Rodney Marsh, George Best and Jeff Stelling on a programme they'd launched not long before that called Soccer Saturday. So I was thinking, well, maybe at some point I might like to go up 
a little bit further north to Newcastle and maybe work for Time Tees Television. There was a woman up there called Margaret who'd been there since the very beginning, who basically ran the gallery. So I was like, I'd like to go up there and understand how a TV gallery works for a bigger operation, which I did for a couple of days. And then I asked to come down to Sky Sports to see how they work. And I had thought at the time, maybe one point in the future, I would like to go and work for Sky Sports, but maybe on a production team. I definitely wasn't really feeling the whole presenting thing then. I had no practice. I didn't realize that actually you don't really need much practice. You just go and do it, get on with it and you learn on the job. But at the time I thought it was this great thing that you had to learn at uni and have these skills that you were taught, but you're not, you just go and get on with it. And I used to read teletext out loud, kids watching this probably have no idea what teletext is, but I used to read that out loud just to kind of see how I sounded and just basically for a bit of practice, yeah. Um, and I went down to Sky, sat in on the gallery for a couple of Saturdays, sat with the production team, and the head of Sky at the time was like, you should really try presenting. I said, well, I do little bits on the club channel. And he'd asked to have a look at some of the, the things I'd done. So I showed him some clips and I was very rough around the edges. But as a female who knew her sport, I'd obviously studied journalism, got a really good degree, um, or studied PR marketing and journalism, then specialized. I had a degree, I'd had four years behind me of already working. And we were heading into a World Cup year, 2006. I was 25, 26 at the time and thought, well, maybe this is the time to go and venture into doing something else. But I love Borough TV and wouldn't have left. We were all made redundant. I was too scared to get in touch with Sky to ask to go and work for them or to venture down there. I didn't want to live in London. So I worked for the Enterprise Academy at Middlesbrough Football Club, which is a brilliantly run um, programme where they basically have local children heading into kind of a classroom environment, learning about well, learning business studies, but using a football club to kind of engage them more than they would be if they were just within school. Um, and I helped deliver some of those programs and had great fun working at the football club. Um, but I knew I wasn't going to do that forever, but was just using it as, again, another way of getting an understanding of sport and football, but not wanting to leave sport and football, but kind of not really knowing where I fit at the time. So my dad had said Sky were quite keen to see me again. I came down and did a, a screen test where they basically use that day's news and you have to sit in front of it. I'd never used an earpiece um, with so many people in your ear before. I'd obviously done it at Borough TV, but you had one person giving you a count and it was pre-recorded most of the time. So was, you could stop and start again. So I went down, did a bit of a screen test. The most exciting thing was I got my hair and makeup done. So I was like, wow, look at me. I almost look like a news presenter. <laughs> um, I did that, um, said my goodbyes, left the building, got on a little, there's a little shuttle bus that takes you back to the station, popped on that with my little suitcase and went to head back up north and meet my dad after his program at the airport. Because at the time you could fly to Teesside from London, which was great, no longer exists. So it was a nice, easy way of getting up north and back down. And as I was getting the bus to head to the tube to get to the airport on time, this young guy runs after me, which I found out years later, I'll tell you who it is in a minute, comes after me and says, oh, Hayley, Hayley, um, Andy Cairns wants to see you. You, you. you just left. I said, oh, nobody said anything. I just did the screen test and there were other people all lining up to do one as well. So I, did, I didn't know he wanted to see me. I literally sat in his office and he said, I want to offer you a job. I want to offer you a contract. We'll take you on to be a presenter but I want you to work on a production team for a few months and we'll just see how it goes you can come in and practice using the auto cue there was a little room that you could plug an earpiece into listen to the gallery and how it worked because of, I mean it's open talk that you could hear everybody um so it was kind of learning how to listen to people take instruction while still speaking and thinking um which now yeah. Hayley, we better just explain that for, for, yeah. for anybody that doesn't understand that. You're on the news and yeah. you have got so many voices coming through. There's yes. obviously a director that is directing you, but somebody is prompting you with counts if you're coming up to yeah. a specific junction. But the whole of the gallery is open. So if somebody yeah. chooses yeah. to have a bag of crisps or yeah. did you see so-and-so on telly last night or whatever, you're getting the lot in your yeah. ear and you have to discern which bits are relevant to me yes. and are an instruction. I mean, it's a hell of a skill. Yeah. And there could be things going on in your, your earpiece where things are falling apart, something's not going to run, breaking news is coming in, but you're still having to keep it together, just read what's there, 
and you're kind of sometimes you are on edge you're like what is happening here but by hearing that you can kind of anticipate what may be about to happen so i was trying to learn those skills and some people who could have made brilliant presenters because they have the know-how they have wonderful presenting skills they sound great they look professional just can't get the hang of an earpiece an open top the amount of people that have had a conversation going on in their ear and then they've gone yeah okay and you're forgetting you're not supposed to respond to them because you're you, that has happened i remember, I remember there, was, there were a few of us girls and guys who were all kind of learning whilst working on production teams and a couple they just couldn't get the hang of it or they really struggled with the kind of reading in a fluid way so that it just didn't sound like you were it was more sort of about talking to rather than talking at um, so I got the chance to do that and um, yeah about four months into working on a production team um, they, they popped me on air and that's it go on and see what happens um, and the rest is history listen you, you and I could stretch out these anecdotes and make this last for hours and hours but I want to punch to two or three key points and one of the things I did want to talk to you about actually was nerves because mm -hmm. When a lot of people do get an opportunity, or even now, all these mm. years later, I'm guess yeah. I'm guessing in the build up to a major event, maybe in the world of social media, you know, the way it is with people debating and criticizing and all the rest mm. of it. Just how do you look after yourself emotionally? How how what's your recipe in the early days for overcoming nerves? How do you stay on the straight and narrow now and not let all this external force affect you yeah um well before my first screen test i had a glass of wine i'm not gonna lie wow <laughs> we don't necessarily <laughs> recommend this i wouldn't folks. recommend that though <laughs> yeah i would definitely not recommend that because again that um it makes you flushed <laughs> it was nice. I was a little a little pink but i think they just thought that, that was nerves already but someone had told me just go and have a little glass of wine have a little soft and i did <laughs> I went up to Grasshoppers, this little pub across the road from oh, the sky, and had a little drink because I thought, well, <laughs> which is just, I mean, I look back now and think, how? It's so unprofessional. Um, however, it's just getting yourself into a mindset. I'm quite lucky we have hair and makeup, or you're doing your own hair, own hair and makeup. I keep everything quiet, keep everything calm. If I need to read something, I will. I can have the radio on nice and quiet. I tend not to answer calls. I, t I just have a little moment of just just being quite peaceful. I'm a very, very relaxed person anyway. I'm not a very kind of angsty person. I'm not very on edge. Sometimes I'm a little bit too laid back. Um, but I think that's what, I guess, that's one of my best skills on air when we have things going on and it's quite high pressure. Some people can't cope. And that's where having a co-presenter helps because you can help each other out. And if one person's kind of struggling to grasp what's happening or gather the information in a sort of... Um, a calm manner you've got somebody else there to help calm you down you can bounce off each other's uh, bounce off each other and, and help with each other's strengths and weaknesses but i think i am a very relaxed person um i certainly remember when i joined twitter i found comments and negativity very very hard to deal with but being a little bit older and getting into it in my 30s really i wasn't i was quite old when i sort of um properly got stuck into presenting I think if I'd have been in my 20s, sort of early to mid 20s, I'd have maybe taken it to heart a little bit more. Maybe, I don't know, I might have stepped away if, if, if Instagram and Twitter were around because I don't think I could have dealt with the abuse as well. I am quite soft, but I think you just have to be really calm and just think there, there are brain surgeons out there who are entering into um, you know, situations of life and death. There are, people out there whose jobs are far more important than presenters which is there it's entertainment sport should be fun broadcasting should be entertainment yes we deal with serious stories with um racism corruption um I, the list goes on at the moment unfortunately I've, I've dealt with some quite high profile deaths and that can be horrible um and that's obviously where things do slightly change but for most of the time you're just dealing with sport it should be fun it's entertaining it's light-hearted if you stumble over a couple of words it's not the end of the world who speaks perfectly every day um, nobody um again working for sky news is slightly different because you are dealing with hardcore stories all day every day so just think 
we're in sport, you're in broadcasting because you enjoy what you're broadcasting. You're enjoying what you're seeing. You're enjoying what you're reporting on. It's just trying to remember that you're there to enjoy it and embrace it instead of being scared of it. And, and staying fresh on a, how long's a shift? Is it eight hours, six, eight um, hours? On air, four hours, or sometimes six on a sun, on, on, on a weekend, yeah, but four hours on air and probably three or four beforehand doing all the prep and working with the production team. So how do you keep yourself fresh? Let's say like anybody else, you, you might have the odd day where you're not feeling yeah. quite as on it as other days. The stories do repeat, you know, they yeah. come back round again. So how do you always look as though you're on it for the benefit of somebody who might just have switched on and not seen you do that story of the previous three times? Yeah. The bright lights in the studio definitely help. Okay. Having a coffee shop definitely helps. Again, having a co-presenter, we're really lucky that we work together. So when one of you is having a little bit of a lull, there's always somebody there to kind of pull you back up. But in all honesty, um, always reading ahead your stories. Obviously, you should do that anyway. But not just reading your script and having that in your head, especially when hour after hour it can become repetitive. I bring up a ton of different websites, ton of different newspapers. I subscribe to uh, a few online. I'm just always reading. I'm always reading. I'm always having a look at what's going on. And sometimes you find little stories that can pass on to the production team as well that they might not have seen a little breaking story. So I'm always kind of reading and being aware. But I, I do think the adrenaline of being in a studio and being live, regardless of how tired you are, it does just keep you awake. It's strange. Um, it's like if I go to sneeze and I'm on air and suddenly the camera cuts to me, I probably won't sneeze. It's that suddenly you're live factor. Wow. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? If you're just in no, the car. I do, I do, but you're only human at the at the best yeah. of times, aren't you? So, which is, you know, the show must go on. It's not like you're working in a warehouse and you can just go and hide around the back or something because you're having a sluggish day or do something slightly slower. You're in the public eye all the time, and it's a real skill to maintain that. There's a couple of other questions I want to ask you. One is dealing with big characters because, obviously, you were at Sky – but then you went to Man United Television, yes. my MUTV. Yes. You were dealing with an absolute icon of the game. Mm. So how did you deal with Sir Alex Ferguson? How was he with you? How did you build up a relationship and rapport with the great mm. man, please? I think at first very carefully, because I was a young female heading to a, a football club, um, and I wanted him to take me seriously or at least have a bit of respect for me I was just still to him just some young girl whose intentions were unknown to him but hopefully he'd realize after a while that I was there to to present to report on his team as a fan of Manchester United and that I was on his side as opposed to being a journalist throwing questions at him trying to catch him unaware so I didn't in, I did a couple of interviews with him quite early on but we had other um, staff members there who'd worked there a little bit longer than me Mandy Henry one of them who still works there now and for Premier League productions and whatnot and she was very much somebody who I looked to to see how she dealt with him she was Scottish as well I think being having that Scottish link helped it was like right got that got that little thing to throw at him um and she had built up a good relationship with him, but never kind of stepped over the line. It wasn't ever small talk before an interview like you would with maybe one of the players or small talk afterwards. It was very much like, right, OK, we're going to get on with this. It was understanding how incredibly busy he was, respecting that, not wasting his time, making sure you were fully prepared so that I would get in. I would make sure, right, mic's absolutely on. I would make sure they were tested, make sure that the setup looked good through the camera. Uh, make sure that all my questions um, were in my head. I'd sometimes take little cue cards with me, but I'm not one for writing down questions. I maybe put bullet points or I structure how I would like an interview to go. But if it kind of goes another way, I don't want to have to rely on this kind of set formula. But it was always making sure that when I went to interview Sir Alex, I asked him important questions, brief questions, and listened to what he had to say not just having these questions in my head, what's this, what's that, how are you gonna do this, what do you think about that, who are you gonna play, why are you gonna do that, what are your tactics? It was making sure I listened to what he said and picking up on some of those little nuggets. He would maybe feed you something and cleverly hope that you'd pick up on it or delve a little bit further. 
Um, the first time I interviewed him after a game, I had an absolute nightmare. It was the League Cup. United were playing Coventry. It's like, well, they're not going to lose this one. It's Coventry. It was the early stages of, of the cup competition. And they let me do post-match interviews. Um, and United lost. And they put out a really strong team. And I was like, oh, my God. It was the first time and I was doing an interview with Sir Alex. And I had prepped for the celebration. Oh, who would you like to play next? And... You know, you put out a strong team. It says a lot about how seriously you're taking things. Oh, and a couple of younger players coming through that had just been given the chance towards the end of the game. But it was a bit of a disaster. So, yeah, that was the first ever interview I did that I thought, wow, um, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm scared. I think my knees were actually shaking. But I did it. I got on with it and it was fine. The end of the interview, he patted me on the back and said, well done. So I was like, wow, I've done amazing. So Alex has said, well done. And then a few interviews after that, he would pat me on the back and say, well done. And in fact, there, were, there was one day I noticed when I was in the tunnel, in the, in the tunnel where the, the sort of the media congregate, well, it was mainly Sky or the BBC or ITV, whoever it may be that's covering the game, depending on which competition it was. And we were obviously given a great position. And I was next to Jeff Shreves of Sky, who um, I now work with, but wasn't at the time. And I noticed after the interview, Sir Alex Ferguson gave him a pat on the back and said, well done. I was like, oh, it's not just me. Um, and I had a bit of a chat with him about it and he said the day that he doesn't pat you on the back and say well done you'll be like oh god and it's true there was a day where he didn't pat me on the back and say well done and it was that weird kind of there was the psychology there it was almost like he'd done it on purpose because he didn't like that line of questioning but instead of saying anything it was what he didn't say wow that's you a lot to take on hold when you're, know, when you're right? talking about a character of that size isn't it no. before i ask you for your tips i've just got to there's one thing i want to pick up on early on in this conversation you said as a woman it's been a battle mm -hmm. just how hard do you think it's been and how you know can you put it into percentage terms how much harder you think you've had to try than a than a bloke and how has how has the situation evolved over the time you've been in the industry and how much easier is it for, mm -hmm. for women now definitely a lot easier because there are more of them which is great and there have been some wonderful women who've made sure that um, they're trailblazers and that people respect them and can realize that actually women can do this job just as good as men, if not sometimes better, and that we should be treated as equals. Um, so we're really lucky that we have had quite a few women in the industry who've made sure that they have, you know, that they're respected, they're brilliant journalists, whether it be broadcasting or, or written or whatever it may be. Um, it's a funny one, this, because there was a time where I know when I first worked at Sky, I was given the job because I was a girl. I believe I was given it because I was, a, so I had an advantage over a man. It wasn't that I was battling, oh, you're not gonna give me a job because they needed females. They, they wanted a female and a male presenting together. And there weren't that many females who were that into their sport. There was a time when, when, when Sky would put a female on air who didn't really have that much or didn't have that much sporting knowledge that doesn't happen now you can't get away with it now we don't just read yeah. anymore yeah. yes a large percentage of it is auto cue but certainly a lot of the a lot of the slots that i present is very much well you, you're updating live sport all the time you can't script for that but i definitely think there was a there was a time where i was given a job because i was a girl or they you know it was men watching men talking about men particularly on sky when football was so dominant that they needed a female because they knew men would be watching and but we should play those cards, shouldn't we, in life? If an opportunity comes along yeah. because the balance is being redressed, don't be afraid to utilise that opportunity, Hayley? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I think, you know, we're living in a world now, it's multicultural, and we have to obviously reflect that on air as well. So if you're an Asian female trying to break through, there is there's room for you because you just look at – I look around the office and I look at so many different – you know, it's not just a load of men and a couple of females. It's very mixed. It's very, it's very diverse. And I think we have to make sure that we reflect that on screen. And I think Sky haven't been brilliant at doing that. They weren't brilliant at doing that in the past. I think they kind of just stuck to what they knew. Um, this is going back to when I started out, you know, 20 years ago. But there are a lot of, um, a lot of our sort of senior management 
um, roles now are filled by people who have worked their way up through Sky. So those opportunities are given to you within the company, regardless of whether you're male, female or whatever. Um, yeah, I think I definitely had to battle in the early days because people might not have necessarily known that I'd studied journalism or that I was constantly reading papers and reading match reports and saving match programs to look at how things were written. I, I've read every sporting autobiography going from motor racing, which isn't my favorite. I, I, I want to make sure I understand the mindset of, um, of a sportsman or a woman. I read all the, the books that my dad read. I was constantly, you know, picking books off the shelf of, you know, sports stars and teams going back years ago. I read one just on rivalries and I had no idea about, you know, some of the rivalries in sport and football in Argentina and Brazil. So I think being very well read, I think people just look at you and think, oh, she's just a female. She looks like this. She looks like that. She's, she might think she knows a little bit about football. What does she really know? But I think, you know, I'm here. I've studied it. But there's no, well, certainly when I was coming through, there was kind of no margin for error. If you made a mistake, it would be highlighted. I've read a script before where there's been a, a name that's incorrect and I haven't noticed it and I've just read it out loud because you just go into autopilot. And then the next hour... I did it with Jim White once. And Jim White read the same thing the next hour. Did he get one single tweet about mispronunciation or a wrong name? No, I did. I had about 15 tweets and people calling me an idiot and I didn't know what I was talking about. So it's funny how that works, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Not so much anymore, but that that a good few years ago, I remember, I remember that happening and that really bothered me. Listen, it's been an amazing hour together. You've worked in names like Rod Stewart, massive mm -hmm. names like George Best or Alex Ferguson. You're the first contributor to this series that's done it with a bathtub in the back of shop. So I know, congratulations right? on that as well. We're so out of time. I can't even tell oh, you top three um, tips. I'm going to ask you for your number one piece of advice to somebody that might want to follow in your footsteps or enter the world of football, enter the world of sport. What's your absolute number one tip, please, Hayley McQueen? I think getting into the industry you want to work in, doing any kind of work experience, whatever job it may be, it doesn't matter. If you want to work for the BBC, Sky, ITV, PT, or just in television, Go in and do any job that you are given. It doesn't matter because you will find your way once you're in there. You've got to get in there. And it can be very hard to try and get in there. The contacts that you make whilst you're there obviously become very, very valuable. There's so many people I met whilst doing work experience, making teas and coffees that are now in really important positions that could help me, you know, forward, you know, go further with me in my career. Um, I think it doesn't matter what you want to do. Just try and get into an organization that you believe in, that you could see yourself working in. It doesn't matter what role it is. You will find your role. You will find your career. Um, I worked in the fashion department at this morning. I knew I wanted to work in sports broadcasting, but I was in television, so it didn't really matter. I worked as a floor manager when what I really wanted to do was produce. I've worked, you know, I've actually worked the first time at Sky presenting when I really wanted to report, but you will find your way. It's just about getting in somewhere, but try and work for an organization or a company that you believe in um, and that you love and you think you would want to work for, if that makes sense. I don't know. It makes total sense. That was tremendous. Lovely to see you. Enjoy that, baby, and good luck oh. with your return to work. Thank you. Thanks to Hayley McQueen and thanks to you for watching. Keep an ear out for future episodes from the UCFB Insight Series.